Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining our call. Today, <clears throat> we'll be talking about answering the question, you're building a cloud, do you need to buy new hardware? Um, very interesting question and hopefully we can give you some good insights and answers into that. I'm Satnam Johal, Senior Solution Architect within Mirantis. I've worked in the IT industry now for quite a number of years, uh, 25 plus, um, so I'm knocking on a bit, but uh, initially started out in IT support, um, and then more recently, or I'd say to the latter end of my career, I've, I've been quite heavily involved in the sales cycles and technical pre-sales. Um, worked in the past for organizations like DXC, Fujitsu and IBM, as it says on the uh, slide, and uh, that was all before joining Morantis, and I've been here for five years or so. I've worked quite closely with Christian, who I'll hand over now, uh, to now for uh, a brief introduction as well. Hello, I'm Christian Hübner. I am uh, officially Director of Services Architecture at Mirantis, but uh, I do still a lot of uh, architectural work myself, specifically storage and infrastructure, everything that has to do with uh, hardware and uh, the platform underneath the cloud that we are building. Uh, I've advised customers, many customers uh, over the years uh, on what they should do on the hardware side, and uh, I would like to share some of this um, cumulative uh, knowledge with you today. Need to learn Kubernetes quickly? Check out our free ebook with hands on exercises you can complete on your laptop over a short break or lunch. Visit mirantis.com slash learn Kates to download now. What are we talking about today then? So I'll briefly go through uh, some topics on why build an on premise cloud, as that's what we're talking about. What are the typical sort of technology imperatives that, that drive that? Um, do you go public or private? What are the pros and cons? And uh, hybrid or on-premise is, is a key part of the discussion. And then I'll briefly go into what our approach is as an organization, um, how you define what we would call what is an, en an ideal enterprise cloud in terms of requirements, um, and then how we address that, some key infrastructure components from our side. And also I'll start to bring the conversation in towards the whole hardware piece and what we call a minimum hardware footprint that we believe is essential to be successful in deploying an on-premise cloud. Um, then I'll hand over to Christian and Christian will start to delve into the meat of the question and we'll start to look at, uh, do you need to buy new hardware? So what considerations, what are the key sort of contributing factors into that? New versus old, um, great question. Uh, and and that's that's always a question that, that we tend to have to address as well with our customers. Um, and a great, great point there as well. Do we throw away the old hardware? Well, ideally not, but we can discuss that. And then bonus edge case in terms of archival. Okay, right. So I'll crack on with the why build an on-premise cloud. Um, so what are the imperatives that drive the need for this uh, cloud, let alone going on or off premise? Um, ultimately, it is all about business outcomes. Um, technology drives the requirements, sorry, the business, the business requirements drive the technology requirements ultimately. So when we look at this slide, it's just to call out that uh, it's about outpacing your competitors. How do you do that? That's with speed reducing cycle time, innovating faster. Also, um, you want to meet the demands of your customers, naturally. Uh, that comes with agility as well. So having that level of application flexibility, having performance, but also at scale. Um, then from a, another business outcome is act and operate like a service provider. So that's that requirement of an internal, say, IT system, or, or if you're using a cloud provider themselves, but ultimately it's about reducing complexity and cost in owned infrastructure. Um, another key point that is valid, I'd say, and generally across all environments is security. So how do, how do we as a business mitigate and eliminate risk? Um, so it's all about protection of mission critical data, prevention of intrusion. Um, and, and when it comes to aligning hardware with this and sort of technological imperatives such as speed, agility, simplicity, and security, the correct sizing of hardware 
I would say, requires a, a very multifaceted approach. Um, some of the key factors being, uh, as we said, understanding business goals. But then it's also about uh, the workload analysis, analyze the workload, get familiar with what the systems are doing, um, what are the actual hardware requirements that can underpin and address that, assessment, benchmarking, um, security compliance, the discussions we have, simplicity and manageability, cost effectiveness as well. So all of these things start to come into play. Um, and we do appreciate that whilst every organisation can have a technical, well, technically requirements underpinning that are essentially quite alike, but each is unique in its own sense. So um, it's all about tailoring solutions specific to needs and circumstance. So just moving on from that, from a cloud perspective, let's look at the pros and cons of each. So if we look at a public cloud and we look at, say, where that really does nicely fit the bill is small deployments and startups. So typically, <clears throat> startups, this is a great fit. You've got the environment on demand, the services that you need, and uh, off you go. Um, also, we see that larger organizations is usually typically a subset of departments. So it's quite useful in sort of getting, getting the ball rolling. And then where it's also uh, very powerful is to address a irregular workload. Um, so this is where you can see, say, it could be seasonal workload considerations, things like auto scaling, things like knowing that we have these fluctuations in demand. Right? It's, it's very powerful to have as large a resource pool as what a public cloud can give you. And then also a positive is the scalability. It kind of plays plays off on the points I've just made. It's the whole on-demand, pay-as-you-go model, very appealing. And, and when you do look at hyperscalers, they are such a large resource pool. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite an attractive option. In terms of negative, so the pay-as-you-go that I've come across with customers that I've talked to, um, it can go out of control. So as we said, it can be subsets of departments. And as you start to do that at scale across a large organization, costs can start to ramp up. There's also the um, additional costs like data transfer, network costs. There's a the whole management and monitoring and the operational cost overhead that can uh, really start to spiral out of control. And that eventually can end up with a higher sort of total cost of ownership over time as well. There's also uh, essentially the key questions around um, data security and sovereignty. Uh, a few examples being the jurisdiction and legal compliance. So data hosted whilst it's in a public cloud, it may be stored in data centers located across different countries, each with its own set of laws, regulations regarding data protection, privacy, cybersecurity, Ensuring legal compliance across those uh, jurisdictions can become challenging. Also, access to data, laws in the country where the data is stored, may allow local government authorities to also access and seize that data. That can be a problem. Cross-border transfers of data, data residency requirements. So this whole sort of compliance and countries and industries have data residence requirements that, that may mandate certain types of data has to be stored in specific geographic boundaries. So um, that, that's also something that, that we see um, as, as a bit of a negative from public cloud as to where the data can potentially reside. And then also uh, another negative point can be the vendor lock-in. Um, so you get uh, bought into the services, you start to buy into the public cloud environment and, and it becomes very sticky. Um, when you start to look at the plethora of services that are made available within a public cloud provider, especially the hyperscalers, and you start to buy into that ethos and that way of working with the technology stack, you, uh, you, you start to get locked into their way of doing things and moving out can be quite challenging. Okay, moving on to the on-premise piece. Um, here's a plus for the data sovereign uh, sovereignty and security. So the negative I mentioned earlier with the public cloud, those kind of turn the other way. They get flipped, 
flipped on their head in the sense that you can have now data local under company control, legal compliance is under your control and access to data. You have more of a handle on that. Cross-border tra data transfers, that's also in control. And, and also things like audit and assurance. Um, I think that, that's quite a powerful point. There's a higher capex, uh, but a lower TCO over time, so more investment up front. But this is where we start to see how the cloud from a hardware perspective can be optimized, ultimately uh, lower TCO over time as the return on investment starts to kick in. But again, from a hardware perspective, okay, there's a lot up front. But if we start to look at utilizing what we can, where we can, if you have existing hardware, or we're then looking at uh, uh, the cost benefits of buying new hardware and how that compares to, say, running on cloud, that starts to become quite a powerful proposition as well. Um, control and customization, that's also a key positive. Uh, it's all in the control of the company, so you, you can take advantage of, uh, say, community-led innovation as well, things like uh, using OpenStack, which is one of the solutions that we provide, and just accessing new features, functions, sizing and configuring it as best to use the actual um, address the actual use case for your organization that can be quite powerful as well um some of the negatives that that uh, we've, we've pulled up here um so right sizing constraints that, that is that is an important point to call out so although it's a constraint it's all about working this out carefully and correctly um this can be turned around back to a positive in terms of control and customization but it is about uh, getting that right sizing up front. And then physical site and hardware logistics naturally is uh, can be a challenge for any organization. Um, so that, that's good to call out. And then there's uh, the fact that there's multiple skills needed as well. Whilst I'd say things have improved as I've seen over my career in time, um, it is still something that is a requirement that you need uh, a multiple, uh, well, a multi-skilled work workforce okay where can you deploy so in terms of what options are available hybrid is is gaining a lot of transaction it gives you that agility as a positive you choose the best location for your workload it's good to have options this could be functionality driven as well um, absorbing workload peaks that's also key capability of burst address load could be seasonal load and then sizing on-premise cloud for the regular traffic that's uh, that's very that's a very good point that you can whilst you can use the burst capability you can also right size your on-premise environment and then the challenge with that is of course maintaining different environments so this comes down to knowledge it can become more complex as you've got workloads running across different types of cloud environments and again it brings in the skill set play as well um, now Multi-cloud on-premise, this does uh, avoid the public cloud lock-in. Um, and then cost arbitrage-wise, it takes advantage. It enables, say, customers that I've worked with to take advantage of price differences in hardware, um, bulk purchasing, driving stronger negotiation with vendors. And there's also that ability to balance CapEx and OpEx to drive down that lower TCO. And then it's enhancing availability and disaster recovery as well. Naturally, workload and applications deployed across the cloud in HA and also in a resilient fashion within your own environment, you have a lot more control of. Um, in terms of negativity, okay, there's the point around diverse APIs. You've got the whole monitoring stack per environment and networking. Um, but, I, but I also would challenge that in the sense that uh, this can be managed if you've got a sort of standardized API approach, a standardized templated way of deploying your cloud environments. Um, and okay, this naturally falls within the remit of internal IT, but also uh, as you start to say standardize, this can drive down your TCO in the longer term. Okay, I'll move on to the Mirantis approach. So from a Mirantis perspective, what is an ideal on-premise enterprise cloud consist of? So what are the key sort of driving factors for that? 
Well, you want a smaller version of a hyperscaler cloud. That's that's ultimately what you want. And you want it optimized for your specific needs. So optimized being the key word, effectively fine-tuned in terms of hardware and software configuration, and that is specifically for your workload. Also, um, another key point is ultimately you want that to be agnostic to the underlying hardware layers. Uh, so it's vendor agnostic. It's not tied to a particular hardware uh, vendor, and, and that just gives you that degree of flexibility and bringing it back to that cost point as well. Um, it gives you that negotiating power as well. Um, designed with the time to market being the key objective, self-service, automation, unified access. So this is, again, back to sort of templated, automated provisioning, uh, controlled access, and things like addressing easy expansion. So as your cloud adoption uh, program grows, you can easily expand as well. That's what we say is crucial. Um, <clears throat> And then naturally you want it to be provided with the full life cycle management and give you the operational insights, uh, give you that sort of feedback as to how well your cloud is being utilized um, and, and uh, enable for capacity planning ahead of time as well. And then there's the standardized automated security approach as well. So from a templated secure configuration, um, CICD DevSecOps comes into play with that. Yeah, and then um, the whole monitored and designed with a true granular billing system. So this isn't all about an estimated cost. It's This is also within the, your cloud environment capturing key usage and utilization metrics. That is absolutely essential. And then the hosted on-premises but scale. So can be easily upgraded. So this is back to the lifecycle management point without a significant overhaul. Um, the automated expansion I, I kind of touched upon, adding nodes, uh, be it for additional storage or compute capacity, but ultimately you, you want something that is able to, to scale and also be lifecycle managed um, in as easy and a simplistic fashion as you can. Okay, so how do we do that? How do we, from Marantis, address that? I won't go into each sort of component in detail, but just to give you a high-level overview, um, what, what our solution consists of is a, a centralized orchestrator that handles the deployment and management of uh, MKE. So MKE is our Marantis Kubernetes engine. It's a Kubernetes cluster deployment and lifecycle management piece in the middle showing there. So um, Apps can be run directly containerized. So if you look at the right-hand side there, we're showing that we can address containerized applications and some examples there showing sort of IoT use case, 5G and Edge, uh, regulated industries, address hybrid cloud. And then when you look on the left-hand side, the virtualization stack, that's more the on-premise discussion that we're having here. But also we have experience with, in <clears throat> either environment with addressing various different types of workload. Again, some examples that we're showing there, a 5G and edge use case, each with its own unique requirements, addressing infrastructure as code for our customers, legacy workloads can be deployed, virtualized, as well as handling things like uh, big data um, solutions that are required as well. And then naturally the whole logging, monitoring and alerting is, is part of our solution stack, enabling that, that sort of granular level of billing and then there's a secured registry component. Again, I, I won't go deeper into this technically here as this talk track is related more to hardware re, reuse or, or purchasing new, but I just want you to be aware that this is our approach. Um, there's ample documentation presentations as well that we have, and, and also feel free to reach out to me if you want to dig deeper into any of these components. But if we move on to the uh, on-premise cloud piece, so, Let's take a look at what a cloud could look like from a Marantis product set perspective. And let's also drill into uh, hardware, just, just in a sort of terms of a node count, what we would recommend for an enterprise grade on-premise cloud. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have this centralized automation piece and that's the Marantis Container Cloud 
instance that's shown on the left hand side. Um, deployments are in threes so that we can accommodate HA and quorum purposes. Um, and as you can see, we've got the three Varantis Container Cloud instances there in quorum. And then we have the Varantis Kubernetes engine. Now, that essentially underpins our cloud environment. From a infrastructure perspective, you, we, we would recommend that you allocate three physical nodes uh, to be the sort of Kubernetes manager nodes. And then the worker nodes, you'd have three that are dedicated to form the function of the OpenStack control plane. Um, and this is purely uh, the, the management and control plane that we've talked about there. But just remember that we can, we can start to expand that out. And that's when we start to come into discussions around actual workload. But um, when we do come to workload, and when we start to size out hardware, this is where the compute and bare metal nodes and uh, storage nodes start to come in to play. So whilst we've got the control plane, the compute and storage nodes is, is essentially where the workload comes into play. Um, uh, and and what, what we uh, recommend or what we, we, we aim to do is with our customers is to, to get a solid grasp on the planning up front um, it's essential to start to understand from a compute perspective what is it that you require, what level of uh, workload and CP is it CPU intensive, is it memory intensive, what is a network load, can the nodes be shared, um, things like CPU over subscription start to come into play as well. And so I suppose the point that I'm making is, is just having that solid grasp on the planning up front is key to our success as well as for our customers. Um, and that's also essential from a storage perspective as well. What are, what are your performance requirements? What is the workload doing? What performance do you need in terms of IOPS? Um, what is the actual usable storage that you require? These are all key in ensuring correct sizing of the platform. And the, the typical discussions that we would have are at a sort of pre-sales stage, way before we would, we would get into a low-level bill of materials, is where we start to look at also uh, how can we configure the cloud environment once we know that this is the type of hardware that you require. Um, do you have differing profiles? Is there different workload? Do we not now have to have a subset of compute nodes opposed to a pool? a concentrated pool of aggregated compute. So uh, we have the software capability with an open stack to start to, to split that out as well. Um, and that's where we use things like host aggregates. Um, and, and then there's also the question of, well, where do we place the hardware? Uh, there's, there's the definition of avail availability zones. And we look at, say, do we address this on a failure domain perspective? Is that failure domain at the rack level? Is it the spine and switch? Is it multi-rack? Uh, do we, for larger deployments, look at different fire compartments within a data center? So all of this starts to play into the hardware configuration, the number of nodes that are required appropriate to fit your use case. Um, and these are discussions that we, we, we start to have, but Christian will sort of dig deeper into some of the, the hardware-based questions. But I just thought I'd give a whole high level overview there. Um, and then another point that I'd like to make as well, when it comes to deploying clouds and the number of clouds that are deployed, we do also always uh, emphasize that it's important to consider a staging environment. So this is where you can do your sort of pre-upgrade checks. Um, you can do your testing within that. And if required, having a lab environment as well, but they can be of a smaller size. So whilst I've given this as a minimal hardware setup, we do maintain a degree of flexibility in the sense that this can be collapsed or expanded out, depending upon the use case. Anyhow, um, uh, I've probably talked enough, um, but uh, this is generally all about trade-offs, old versus new. Um, do we reuse, reconfigure, um, take resources from a hardware uh, configuration and say bump up another, but that, that kind of conveniently leads me on to the next piece, which I'll 
hand over to Christian to, which is all about addressing the question, do you need to buy new hardware? Okay. So let me start with an example. This is, um, it's not untypical. This was one of the more, um, let's say, antique environments that I have seen that somebody wanted to deploy an OpenStack cloud on. They had um, a whole set that was, I remember something around like 30, 40 servers that were all over 10 years or about at that point, about 10 years old. Um, they were um, Intel, still Intel Xeon E5s. Um, and they had a storage cluster with all hard disk. They didn't even have um, flash devices for uh, the, in this in this case, it still was was a very old cluster for their journals. So it was just, it was simply just flat hard disk. And they said this cluster, the whole cloud is too slow. The whole cloud is just not fast enough for what we want to do. The performance. Uh, we, we, do we need to? But can can we still deploy the new cloud onto this uh, onto these old servers? And I said, well, in principle, in theory, yes, you can. You will have the same problems that you have right now. You have the same. You will have the same performance issues that you have right now, uh, and you will also with ten year old servers very likely run into uh, reliability problems at some point. So the question, can you deploy, is clearly yes. This is just going to run just as, uh, just as well or not well on that um, old hardware as it does, in, does on the new hardware. Before we continue, I want to make one uh, remark here. If you are just building a cloud as a um, test or dev cloud that is not very heavily loaded, that only has a few compute nodes, a couple of storage nodes, then uh, a lot of this does not apply. The performance part does apply, but the cost part does really not. If the cloud is not heavily loaded and you're not um, really trying to scale out, you will probably not get anything from buying new servers. So conversely, if you have a whole bunch of old servers and you want to build a cloud from new servers, it would uh, possibly be a very good idea to build a staging cloud out of the old servers and then maybe a cloud for your engineering teams that can uh, that do not again do not um, have a lot of performance requirements, and uh, so the servers do not really have to be thrown away, but but can be repurposed. Next slide, please. Sure. Okay. So the the last ten years were let's say a wild ride in hardware. First of all, processor performance has gone up drastically. And the interesting part is a lot of this has actually happened within the last four to five years. When Intel switched from the Xeon E5 architecture uh, to the Xeon scalable architecture, there was the first performance jump. And then the next performance jump was when the Xeons uh, went from the first and second generation to the third generation. So uh, there is, at the moment, you can say um, the base model, the, 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 just the smallest CPU that Intel normally regularly sells uh, in, in this range, um, is about four times as fast as a not quite base um, Xeon from about 10 years ago. Same goes for mid-range CPUs we, uh, I've had um, back in the day. We had quite a lot of customers that chose the E5 2650 was by far the best in terms of performance per price. And if you compare that with today's performance per price, um, high spot, again, about a four times improvement. But where it really has hit was at the top. The, um, the CPUs that um, we, we were very limited in core counts. And uh, for instance, at um, uh, E5 2690 V2, this is um, was the top CPU back then, at around 20, cost 20 or 22 cores. And then Epic, currently an Epic uh, 9654 has uh, 128 cores. So the performance, uh, the performance jumps have been pretty, pretty uh, egregious. Same has gone on the memory side. Um, I mean, the, uh, the larger modules, 64 gigabyte modules were impossibly expensive seven, eight years ago when they came out. 
And now the um, memory pricing for modules from 16 to 64 gigabytes is about the same. And then interestingly, when you want to buy 128 gigabyte modules, they are four times as expensive per gigabyte as the 64 gigabyte modules. And I've had recently, I had a customer who told me, well, we are, we are standardizing on 128 gigabyte modules. I told them, well, this is really not a good idea, especially not as um, you have different uh, memory requirements. Some servers only require 256 gigabytes of memory or so. Um, then you, do not, you cannot um, populate all your memory channels with those 128 gigabyte modules. So not only are you paying a lot of money for the memory, you also are going to have only part of your memory channels populated, which means com uh, simply comparatively bad memory performance. And then the last thing that happened, and this has been more, most evident over the last four to four, five years, is that flash storage has essentially superseded hard disk. If you look at performance hard drives, uh, typically two terabyte, two and a half inch drives that go into this um, classic 20, uh, 24 disk 2U chassis, um, these have been entirely superseded by two terabyte or even four terabyte flash drives because if the cost for those um, old hard drives is actually um, so high that it really does not make sense to buy them anymore. Yeah, so, good, good point there, Christian, as well. You know, you know, we've often talked about sort of sub suboptimal memory channel allocation as well. Um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Where... Yes. Um, I mean, it's not that uh, if you are only populating, uh, for, let's say a CPU has eight memory channels like the current Xeon, e uh, Xeon scalables. Um, if you're only populating memory channels, uh, uh, half the memory channels, you will not find that the system is going to run only at 50%. You may, you may see um, like a 10% decline or 12% decline, something like that, except for extremely memory heavy applications. But um, if you imagine you have to buy 10% more nodes uh, to satisfy your memory requirement because you're not populating the memory channels properly, um, it is certainly um, uh, it's, it is certainly a, a problem that uh, can, that cannot be um, overlooked. Yeah, great point. We, we've done a lot of discussions with customers around that as well, haven't we? And there, there's whilst you can buy more memory, is the is the actual allocation within the chassis that that is is crucial to uh, performance as well. So, so um, this is actually a pretty good um, point to make another uh, important um, uh, another important observation in a cloud environment if you if you have something that um, like an application that uh, is running a, a, a high core server with a lot of memory to its absolute limit this is not an application that you typically run in a cloud maybe you run it in with, with ironic um, uh, on hardware um, in within a cloud the cloud control but you're normally not running it on the cloud platform simply because the uh, amount of uh, performance that your uh, virtualization platform eats is too great. But um, there you may have actually a server where you have uh, high CPU count, high CPU core count, high memory count, whatever. If you build a cloud, you want mid-range machines. You want machines, uh, if you go to the very bottom end, you will have to have too many machines and then the um, overhead for each chassis will eat you up. If you go to the high end, both on memory modules and also on CPUs, you will see that the cost is simply um, drastically higher than it is uh, than it would have to be. So, um, next next slide, please. Okay, let's look at another example, um, a real world example. You have a, a, want to build a cloud with five hundred virtual machines, and each of those is pretty standard: four core, eight gigabytes, and two hundred fifty gigabyte storage. Your, um, upload, uh, the Linux fans under you will probably say 250 gigabyte storage. What are you going to do with all of that? And then you look at the um, at the Windows Microsoft Windows uh, Server base image, and you will find uh, where the 250 gigabytes come from. If you average out, you will be looking at maybe um, 150 gigabyte images, and then uh, another 100 gigabytes of data. So, if you build a cloud with very old CPUs, let's say we have a four times over subscription. And 
So you need um, with four, 500 virtual machines with four cores, we need 2,000 2, uh, virtual cores. And with four times over subscription, you need 500 physical cores to provide those, um, those 2,000 virtual cores. So you would uh, have about 42 nodes that you will need to uh, feed uh, the, these applications. The same storage, 420 terabyte raw. This is um, three, ti three times uh, uh, um, raw, about three times the, the storage capacity because you uh, have three times replication in a typic typical OpenStack and Ceph environment. So you would have to have, to have uh, 210 two terabyte hard disks, which means 12 nodes with 18 hard disks each. And you would um, typically, uh, you would have four times 10 gigabit ethernet, which is not really a problem because the hard disks are so slow that you are uh, going to uh, have pl plenty of headroom for, uh, for the, um, the application IO. Now well, let's compare this with something something new. Let's say um, as our new processors are considerably faster, we go with eight times over subscription. So you need 250 physical cores, which would be with mid-range CPUs would be for instance, 12 nodes, depending on what CPU types you, uh, you choose, but this is about going to be about mid-range. And with the, story, with the storage, this uh, story is the same. Typically nowadays, you do not have two terabyte storage devices anymore. The current largest devices that you can buy on the open market are 30 terabyte uh, devices from uh, um, Kioxia or Solidang uh, or, or Micron. And these devices, uh, and uh, again, you do not want the highest end, but uh, 7.68 terabyte uh, or even 15 terabyte NVMEs are uh, currently the state of the art. So you will have a lot less, a lot fewer devices. You cannot cut your nodes quite as much because uh, the, the uh, flip side, you also need a lot of CPU to drive NVMEs to their limit. But this, these nine nodes with six devices are going to be drastically faster than the Windows device, uh, than the hard disk devices that we had before. And I mean, to the tune of uh, 100 times performance or more. Obviously you need faster networking to do that. Another next slide. Just on that as well, Christian, is it worth mentioning any anything around the efficiency with the power co power consumption? Yeah, that's, that's where the whole thing becomes interesting. The uh, old uh, uh, the old platform with forty two nodes and the CPUs that um, would put out a lot less cycles per watt. Um, you would will have a considerable additional outlay in power and also in cooling because every watt that you feed into your servers will also have to be cooled again afterwards. So uh, the oper uh, so operating this old platform, which you don't, oh, don't have to pay because you already have it, is uh, going to cost you a considerable amount of extra money. And so to get back to the example that we had at the beginning, I calculated this for the customer and we found out that the a point where the power and cooling savings were making up um, for the entire purchase price of the cloud uh, was, uh, was around three years. So if you're writing off your cloud over four or five years, like as, as customary, um, if you keep that old cloud running, it's actually going to come considerably more expensive over five years than uh, it would have been to just buy new hardware and run, the, uh, and, and run the applications on that. One more thing, by the way, this is uh, not on the slide here, but this is something also to consider. If you are going to go from a very old cloud to a new cloud, um, and you try to do that by upgrading step by step by step by step, um, this is uh, going to be a very long and tedious uh, process. And um, it, in many cases, it is simply easier to build a new cloud with the most modern version of uh, Mosk and the most modern version of OpenStack and of Ceph and of StackLight. So you do not have to upgrade anything and then just migrate the applications over. This is in many cases, this is going to be really um, a lot faster. Not to mention the fact that you need to, in the end, you would probably need to uh, migrate the application anyway, because um, you want to, at least even in an old cloud, 
uh, it at least makes sense to replace uh, the hard disks uh, step by step with uh, SATA uh, SATA SSDs, um, which will fit into the same slots as um, uh, as two and a half inch hard disks. And so the data has to go from here to there anyway. Otherwise, you are not going to escape the um, extremely poor poor performance of the uh, of the storage devices. Um, these are very typical conversations we have as well, aren't they? Yes. Quite... Yeah, I mean, this is we have had this conversation with customers many a time before, and I know how tempting it is to say, "Yeah, I have uh, I have all this hardware lying around. Why don't I just build on it?" Yeah, yeah, naturally. Um, uh, I personally, I'm not really a big fan of throwing away things just because they are old. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, if you look at the energy bill, uh, energy, uh, um, the, the energy bottom line, which in today's uh, market is actually going to be pretty important, um, we will find that uh, operating that old cloud at full tilt for another five, four or five years is going to be not, not not necessarily good for the environment. Yeah. Not and most likely not better than actually buying new nodes. Yeah, and we we have customers that are measured specifically on that as a key metric as well. So, okay, so here is what uh, what um, the observation for the slide before um, would be. Uh, the new uh, environment would be twenty one rack units tall versus sixty six. So basically, um, by smaller by two thirds of the total. The storage would be more, way more than a hundred times faster, and also more reliable because uh, I have changed a lot of hard disks. So I have I had my data center technicians change a lot of hard disks over time. Uh, and the hard disk is a mechanical thing, and if you stress it too much, it will break. Hard disks uh, uh, do break at uh, at some point, and flash storage is by not by now at the point. You know, uh, everyone says flash storage, um, the, the, they have a limited number of write cycles. But in reality, in almost all environments, the flash storage devices are going to be outdated way before they actually die. Yeah. You have faster networking, you have maybe roughly a quarter of the power and cooling cost, and uh, also escape the reliability concerns with the old hardware. So throw everything away, everything. Um, in the example, I would say this, the hardware is not really good for production use anymore. These uh, servers can still make a reasonable staging cloud and they can make a reasonable engineering test and development cloud that is not heavily loaded. But for, if you're uh, throwing your full tilt production with hundreds of workloads and a lot of power consumption uh, at this, um, this is not, uh, a place to keep that old hardware around. What it is for your personal use case, for everyone who's here, um, the calculation is individual for every uh, cloud pro project that we have. We have customers where it makes more business sense to uh, reuse the old hardware. We have customers where it does not make business sense at all. But uh, the important thing is to at least uh, in the beginning think about um, is that, does that what I'm doing here actually make sense? Does it make technical sense and does it make business sense? Technical sense would include, um, yeah, I mean, I have had storage performance problems for a long time. Um, wouldn't it make more sense uh, to go to an all flash platform to uh, to escape, just to escape the, the endless uh, battle for IOPS on hard disks? And uh, business sense is uh, if I tell if I tell my uh, chief financial officer I spent a hundred thousand dollars on new hardware, but I say I, I, over the next three years I will say say one hundred and thirty thousand dollars in power. Um, the chief financial officer is not going to be nearly as unhappy about you buy, buying new hardware any more than it, than he is uh, when you just uh, show him the, the the quote from from Dell or from from HP or whatever, whoever you buy from. So bottom line is, there is no real answer for the question. Um, look at what you have, look at what generation it is, look at where your personal problems lie, performance problems with CPUs, memory exhaustion uh, and everything. And then think about whether it makes sense to upgrade. We, we are here if, uh, um, if you want to talk to us, uh, we, are, we have um, insights 
and uh, also um, I have I run my own tooling for calculating whether this makes sense or not. But uh, just think about it, and uh, and uh, it will in many cases it will just the answer will just present itself, or um, ask the uh, ask for somebody uh, to uh, to make this make this calculation for you. I have one more slide. This is kind of a bonus slide. So we had we just said hard disks are obsolete, and they are in uh, everything that is performance built. Uh, that web IOPS and uh, throughput count hard disks are obsolete. There is no uh, um, you would have to buy so many spin spindles to get a reasonable number of IOPS out of them that it is uh, economically not feasible. But if you have, and I had just had a case like this, if you want to store a petabyte of data that is purely archival, it's a slow input stream, there's no high IOPS, this is large, uh, large files being written at a comparatively um, sedate pace, but all day long. Uh, hard disk may still make sense, but the very uh, top end, the 20 terabyte hard disk costs, what, 500 bucks, something like that, or 550 bucks. Uh, 20 terabyte, uh, 30 terabyte NVMe still costs about $3,000, $3,500. So um, in uh, this case, uh, hard disks may still make sense, but in this, in this case, this, um, this customer actually wanted to store 16 petabytes on spinning uh, on spinning drives. And then uh, I, I thought about the problem for a little bit. And uh, I was uh, thinking, you know, when I um, years ago I uh, lived with tape robots, with a um, whole rack of uh, tape robot feeding in every day for the 20, 30 backup tapes, um, pulling out the backup tapes, sending them to my to Iron Mountain. So uh, for this for, for this case. It makes most sense to say, okay, I'll build a buffer store that is again made out of flash drives. Let's say 500 terabyte, 250 terabytes, depending on how uh, high the speed, the ingestion speed is and how much buffer you want. Uh, and then uh, put the tape library, a whole rack full of tape library in it. And you will find that this costs, the tape library costs 20% or 25% of what uh, the hard disks will cost. But the, big, the biggest advantage of this is that the amount of power a tape library consumes compared to a, uh, the amount of power that, that uh, 200 or 400 hard disks consume is a fraction. Because these tape libraries are not particularly power hungry. Plus, um, the tape library is almost unlimited capacity. So if you have, for instance, a use case where you have to keep uh, data for uh, legal compliance, um, you can just move off the, da uh, the data to tape and then move the tape off to um, whatever facility that, uh, uh, that is convenient for you. And uh, you will find that from an economical standpoint and also from an environmental standpoint, um, this may actually be the... the the ticket for you. So tape, which was uh, essentially declared dead, what, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, is actually still useful if you just have the right use case for it. And this is what I want to close my, my uh, explanation with. Uh, the thing is, you always have to look at your use case first. This is built buying hardware. Okay, I'm going to buy servers with 64 cores and 1.5 terabyte RAM. That never leads to anything. What do you need? Uh, if, um, the first thing you would calculate is how many uh, cores you will need, how many, how much memory you will need. You will find the, the appropriate ratio between between that, how much storage you need, and then uh, go from the use case uh, to the hardware that you want to buy. And this is just an ex example that the use case um, that the use case dictates the hardware. And sometimes in ways that you do not really expect when you were first looking at the problem. I hope this was all uh, informative for you and I hope it was not too boring, but uh, I think this is something that is worthwhile for everyone who is operating private cloud um, to consider in intervals, um, is that what, what I'm doing here is still the right thing for my use case. Thank you everyone additional information so there's um but yeah no no great great i i do really hope that this this has been useful um 
and and I do like to thank everybody that has made taken the time and effort to to join the call. It's it's much appreciated. That's just to give you an idea and an insight into what we do, how we approach clouds. Christian shared a lot of information in terms of uh, hardware and reuse and, and what we can do there. So if there's any questions that you do have, yes. yeah, so please don't hesitate to give us a ping. Um, there's a lot of information on our Morantis website, but also you'll find more detailed information in terms of architecture reference guides or deployment guides or operational guides all found on the docs.morantis.com. But uh, yeah, I'll close out the call and just say, Thank you very much for your time. It's much appreciated. Thank you, everyone. It was a great opportunity. I think uh, um, it was a thank you, Thank you very much for hosting this. And uh, Grace, who has been uh, organizing the the talk, I think this was um, uh, some really good opportunity. Yeah.